I'm Beverly White with NBC4 here to present the next panel on When School Shooting is the Story. We're honored to be here right now with two very esteemed journalists. We're talking today about the media's role in coverage of the events you've just been hearing about this morning. Speaking now, first, of course, here on my right, to introduce yourself, please. Yep. Um, I'm Keisha Kluke. I'm an education reporter for Newsday on Long Island. Uh, previously, I covered state education in New York for Politico. I've also worked at a number of local um, local newspapers and covered crime in different aspects. So it really all kind of adds into this discussion. And Lindsay. Hi, I'm Lindsay Powers, and I've been a journalist for 15 years, uh, most recently at Yahoo, where I oversaw a lot of kids' coverage, family coverage, culture coverage for the 600 million monthly readers. Um, I was also the editor-in-chief of Yahoo Parenting, where we talked a lot about, you know, not only covering the unfortunate incidents of school violence, but also how we can protect our own communities and speak to our children about it. And I'm currently writing, writing a parenting book called You Can't F Up Your Kids, using research to show that your kids will be okay. All right, let's dive right in, as the previous panelists did a short time ago, with regards to your biggest challenge when you cover a school shooting. Lindsay, let's start with you. I think it's just we're human, too, as journalists. I'm, I'm a mother, and it's so terrible from the human point of view that you would never want something like this happening to, to your family, so, it's, so that's terrible. But then also the idea that there's the stories breaking fast, and it would be terrible to cover something erroneous or incorrect. And Keisha? And, and I would kind of jump off that too. I think accuracy and reminding yourself of the ethics. Um, there's a lot of decisions being made because we're a 24 hour news cycle now. There's a lot of editorial decisions being made very quickly and wanting to kind of balance the wanting to be first and get the story out first with also the idea of wanting to be right and you in these situations especially because they're so sensitive they're so emotionally charged you don't want to report something that's incorrect because that could be something that goes viral and then how do you kind of reel it in let's talk now about why some school shooting coverage lasts for days and others it's over in an instant just a matter of hours after the fact can you speak to us about that distinction i think just in uh, journalism in general, there are sort of time, uh, timeliness and things that make it more newsworthy than others. Not that saying one shooting is more newsworthy than others, but I would say that the size and the scope. But it's interesting to see how with the Parkland shooting in particular, they had that launching point with social media. Students, parents, families, viewers were watching this live from Instagram. They were watching it on Twitter from the kids themselves, from the teachers. And so that, um, I think, really boosted it and gave it this sort of push that the other shootings didn't have. Right. Well, and I think that it's terrible to say, but now, unfortunately, in our society, school shootings have become so prevalent that we'll say, oh, it was only this many students that were impacted, or it was this kind of a neighborhood where it happened. And I'm not proud of that as a journalist, but that tends to be a lot of editorial decisions that we're going to put th this many resources into it. I think also, as you mentioned with Parkland, the fact that those students were so interactive, um, that's, it's like a new dawn of students having the voice to be able to become a participant in the, in the coverage of it. And so that, of course, drives the conversation and keeps journalists engaged. Okay. I'm a local correspondent, so I'm a bit more connected to the schools, the types that we're speaking of. But as national correspondents, dispatching people to big stories, do you feel the tendency to parachute in, not really knowing the lay of the land, can be prohibitive as you're seeking the facts away from the noise? How do you how do you work that out? I think so. And I've been on both sides of it as a reporter that parachutes into a big story and, you know, with a map and a phone and just talking to everyone. Um, and it's obviously if you're a local, it's much easier. You can connect, you know where to go. But I think that ultimately we're all connected by our humanity and a good journalist who is willing to walk around and introduce himself or herself to a lot of people and to really be fair and to listen and report accurately um, can still get, get a good story. And I think there's a balance, too, between people um, when you're parachuting in to a story and then also as a local journalist, some people kind of have that feeling where, oh, I want to give the story to the local journalist because they have that sort of hometown um, camaraderie. But then also 
the Times, like if you're not going to be, when, when are you going to be in the New York Times again? So there's sort of a push for maybe we'll give scoops to the New York Times. So it's kind of interesting as a reporter on both sides of it coming into these. And social media has complicated your job, obviously. It sounds like the, the, the fire hose of information. Yeah. How do you break out, again, the news from the noise? Well, what's so interesting, so I've only been, I've been a journalist for 15 years, which is a, a decent amount of time. And social media has changed the landscape so quickly over that. I mean, when I first started, it wasn't a thing. And now we have so much more information, especially uh, at a site like Twitter, where you can really be on the ground getting information in real time. But that also is a way for a lot of inaccurate information to proliferate. And we're there, we're on the ground, news are breaking quickly, as you've said, you know, as you know, it's a 24 hour news cycle. So I think it'd be helpful and hurtful. And I think as a journalist, it's important when you're having, especially on Twitter, when you're having these live conversations to say, hey, we heard this. We have not been able to say whether or not it's accurate and, and maybe sort of interacting with people when they say, have you heard this? Is it true? And, and being responsive as well. But it's also a great, a great way to use social media to be able to be on the news as it's happening and then for follow-up stories, which I think is really important and something as an editor that I've overseen a lot, which is kind of after the initial story is broken, how can we humanize the victims? How can we, you know, talk to our communities to prevent this from happening in their own community? And that I think is really important to be able to go on a site like, you know, Facebook or Twitter and be able to reach out directly, especially as newsroom budgets are increasingly cut. Um, so there's not as much, you know, time and resources to travel, um, it's, a, it's a great way to be able to connect to people in a community in a way that you may not be able to even if you're there in person. Mm -hmm. Keisha, how about verification? If you're using the social media stream as a source, how do you confirm or deny what you're looking at before you choose to publish your print? I think it, it really depends on the information itself. In any situation, for example, in a school shooting, you would want for, straight from law enforcement, ideally uh, straight from school administrators. Um, but then I think it is difficult as a journalist because if you're not getting those answers right away and your editors are saying, everyone else has this, where is it? How do you get people who are actually there? Um, and I think uh, it's interesting the Education Writers Association has a guide for reporters and for in, in covering school shootings in particular, which is sad that we have to have it, but great that there's a, a resource. And some of the things they talk about is not surrounding your story by one particular victim's memory memory because in these situations your memory could you know betray you and so making sure that you're using those those stories to personalize and humanize it but not necessarily rely on it for all of the facts. I know right off the top Lindsay you said we're human and people need to remember the journalists aren't robots rolling into these locations. Is self-care a part of your agenda in your newsroom for your oh. people you dispatch, stories you're editing, even if you're not in the field per se, you're receiving that and it can be traumatic. I, it's true. I wish self-care was a bigger part of it. I think it's almost like self-self-care in the sense that you cover a story and then I go home and play with my kids and try to cut it off as much as you can, but it does, it, it impacts you. And I think as an editor, I'm, I always try to be really cognizant of the fact that the people on my team who are spending day in, day out talking to parents, talking to students who are affected by these terrible acts of violence, um, that they also are able to step back and, and you know, take a, take a breather, not be on a story for weeks and weeks. Mm -hmm. And I found that personally, when I'm covering it, you almost get caught up in this energy uh, of just trying to, you know, do it right, do it accurate, um, get this story first, and it doesn't hit you until you're done reporting on it that, oh my gosh, this was a terrible thing, and, and it is difficult to have those conversations when you're talking, when you're hearing the students tell their story. That's hard to continue the questioning, um, but I think that really the the impact is afterwards. And so I usually try to do something to let off steam. And I have had editors who would say, okay, now we're gonna have you cover like a puppy parade or something positive afterwards, just to give you a little bit of a break. So there's no systems in place, but you're saying case by case. Mm -hmm. All right. right. We've got a lot of material to cover, and I know you probably overheard the conversations this morning, as did I, from the students who were so open. Is that often the case when you're correspondents or when you're in the field approaching people specifically at the school shootings? Because that's the focus of our coverage today, of our gathering today. It's school shootings. What makes them different from shootings in other settings? Oh, well, when you have someone who's younger, I, I feel like it's all emotion right there. And so you always get 
a much better, um, just people are so open, they're raw, it's emotional. So I feel like they are just really open to share their story. And kids today are so used to being really open and vulnerable and putting everything out there on social media that it's not different than them just speaking to you face to face. So I think, unfortunately, that, you know, these kids are so young, but they are, they've just grown up with being open. So they are very willing to share their experiences. You've grown up with the drills, the school resource officers, that's their reality? My four-year-old does school safety drills. Starting in preschool, he comes home and talks to me about this. It's, it's really unfortunate that we need to even be doing this, but it's, it's normal to my kids. And how about you? And, and I think, and just to piggyback on that with the, the students, it's, they're very open and it's raw and it's in a setting that you don't expect. I mean, we, we do now to some extent, which with the drills, which is really unfortunate that we have to have this conversation, but a school setting is supposed to be, you know, a safe place. Um, you're supposed to, ha you're not expecting it to happen there. And so for students to have it in a space where they're supposed to be just out there learning and growing, it's really a different atmosphere. And now we're hearing students who really Really relate to I mean the student panel this morning was amazing um, and and they're seeing them as role models I mean they are taking I was able to go with a group of Long Island students down to the March for our lives and they were able to take that back home and then be active and so it's really interesting to see that um, students are, are kind of working this out in their heads even if they weren't affected by shooting as well so it splashed over into their world and they feel they own the story. Yeah, and, and they want to they wanna be protected. And they're talking about on their lunch breaks, where am I safe in the school during a lunch break? Which is really heartbreaking to hear that they're saying, oh, well, there's glass over there, so we probably don't want to have snack over there. Um, and, and these are the conversations that are being had, but also important that they're being had and that the students are sticking up for themselves and making change or forcing administrators to make change. Well, it's empowering the situation where students are so disempowered in a place where the school shooting and it seems like there's not a lot being done to keep students safe, um, to be totally honest. And so I think by the students having a voice, being able to participate in the media, participate on social media, it, it does, it really empowers them and give, gives them some control in a situation that they may not otherwise have it. I think that may have been the headline coming out of the morning panel, that the students want to be included, involved, and respected. So you're saying that the students you've approached in these settings feel the same way. What about privacy? How are the parents with you talking to their children in these most upsetting settings? I think the idea of privacy is so different now. There are so few parents that are like, I don't want my kids on social media. I mean, now, like, again, going back to my four-year-old, I even sign a form that says it's okay for him to be in photos with his school. So I think if we're respectful, we open ourselves up, introduce ourselves to the parents. Um, I have, it's, it's very rare that there are people who just absolutely do not want to participate. I found it a little bit both ways. Um, and, and being respectful, if you do approach someone and and realizing that they're grieving, they're going through all these emotions, so if they are rude or angry or yelling at you, that you just kind of don't take it to heart and, and realize and respect it and give them their space. And I, as a journalist, in any sort of um, trauma situation, would cover it in in a way we're only talking to people who feel comfortable talking to you. But we do, I know that Newsday has a very strict policy about covering minors. And so uh, if they're not 18 years old, we do have to get a uh, guardian permission to do that. So sometimes the school will have a blanket form so you already know through the superintendent that you can talk to them. In a situation like this, I usually would just ask the students, can I have your, your parents' cell phone and then either text or call them and say, I spoke to your student before we, before we use this, do we have your permission? And if they said no, then of course we wouldn't run it. And that tends to be standard procedure on the broadcast side. If we interview a student in this setting, the parent is right there. You know, include them in the shot so the permission is understood that we're not ambushing a child on their very worst day. Let's speak about relationships. I know, again, being national media and maybe parachuting in or dispatching people who parachute in and leave and don't live there, there's maybe not the relationship. But how can school systems forge relationships before the worst day? 
Well, I think uh, something that's really important to keep in mind is, um, as, as you know, as you've said, for a nationwide outlet, it's very hard for us to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with everything. I, I think the idea of including us in the good news is is important. I mean, people really love to read good human interest stories, which is a conversation you know we've had a little bit offline here. And I do I do think that schools shouldn't be afraid to to flag us of great initiatives that they've done in, in their communities or really heartwarming stories. And that's that's a great way to establish relationships at various media outlets. Mm -hmm. So you're not meeting us for the first time on your worst day. Mm -hmm. Exactly. How about mm -hmm. you, Keisha? What's the, what's the best practices in, in that regard? Yeah, and I would say um, Newsday is considered local, but it's of large coverage area, so sometimes it can feel like you're swooping in. Um, but I think just being uh, being communicative with them ahead of time, letting them know who you are, um, sending, I always tell all media personnel, you know, send me everything because if I don't know what's happening, then I absolutely can't cover it. So even if you hear no from me five times, maybe that sixth time is a story that we can do that has that positive um, interaction. And then I think just making yourself available and having, um, it, just not treating the media as the enemy. I think that's something that it can happen a lot where, oh, all these TV, especially in a situation like this, there's all these TV cameras, there's all these journalists, reporters, and it can be overwhelming. And I think just knowing that, you know, they're, we're pretty reasonable too. We have a job to do, you have a job to do, and let's see how we can work together. I know school systems may or may not know how to reach out to us consistently until we show up on their doorstep for something awful like what we're here to discuss. But in the interim, it sounds like you're on the right track in establishing relationships with the superintendents, maybe the teachers for fluffy features or stories that some people used to call fillers or kickers, but you're saying they still matter. Absolutely. I mean, when I was editing the homepage of Yahoo, the stories that would do the best, that were the most widely shared on Facebook and commented on the Yahoo homepage were always these really great little moments that happened, these human interest stories. I mean, we connected uh, someone who was looking for a kidney donor and the actual donor connected in the comment section. So I think the idea that it's not a big national story or didn't raise millions and millions of dollars or, or these traditional you know, milestones doesn't mean it's not a story. There's lots of opportunities for us to work together in positive ways um, so that we can establish a relationship until it all goes south. I think people are looking for good news too. I mean, I know that personally and, and speaking with my family, they they may not always watch the news anymore because they feel like it's so negative and there's so many, every time you turn around there's something that, you know, is going to blow up your, your personal life or your financially, there's something wrong. And so having stories like that where it's just humans interacting and, and showing the good side of humanity, I think that's really important too. I know if you're like me, you were contacted some weeks ago about being here today. I'd like to know what was on your heart when you said yes. What did you want to make sure we communicated with our audience, wherever they happen to be, including our friends here in the room, perhaps, listening, wherever they are, their desktops, their smartphones. What conversation do you want to make sure we don't overlook before we call that's, it a day? Oh, that's such a great question. I, you know, as a longtime journalist and as a parent myself, it was really important for me to have this conversation, even though nobody wants to talk. You know, obviously it's a terrible conversation that we have to um, even look at school violence, even talk about school violence. It's terrible that it happens so much, but I do think it's important that we connect um, on the human level, that we're able to share each other's stories. And so the opportunity to come in and reach a lot of parents to prevent it happening in their own communities was very important to me. And I thought just being part of the conversation, I think the news media is usually the one on the outside watching the conversation or, or sharing it. And so giving kind of the background of what we do and who we are and that we are parents and, and kids and, you know, we have that emotional connection as well, but that we're also doing a job and there's ethics behind it. There's thought behind the decisions. Things aren't just being thrown out there. Um, you know, there's there's thought process to have accuracy and um, and acknowledging that this is an absolutely terrible thing that happened, and we don't want to exploit on and anyone's what happened to them. And so I think that was really important. Um, and then just I think having, like you said, having this conversation in general and and having all these wonderful panelists is really important, so that there is maybe some sort of a resolution to move the conversation forward. 
I know the panel in the middle talked about, among other things, community-based policing. School resource officers are a part of that conversation. Do you have interactions with those people as well? And uh, the reporters you dispatch, the stories you edit, they include a police piece, obviously. What's your best advice for reporters going forward and for viewers, readers, news consumers? What should they be looking for? Accuracy. I think that's really important in a world where there's a lot of voices coming from a lot of different organizations and and platforms. It's it's important to go to the respected uh, media outlets. Just because somebody posted something on Twitter does not make it correct. Um, I think that it's it's great to also, of course, approach the police, approach the school administration and the officials, so that we can confirm what's what's happening. Um, and so I think that people should really be looking at the source of their news and to hopefully expand from just reading it on a social media network and to um, to take the time to make sure they're reading it from a reputable source. I would also recommend reading those second day stories. I was in a, a college class a few weeks ago and there was a police officer that actually talks about um, the media and these sort of situations and the police perspective uh, for it, which was very interesting. And he had said, you know, this story came out and this was wrong or it didn't show this perspective. And that was the thing that went viral because it was the first. And he was just really imparting on the students. When you read the second day story, it may have more background because there is time to report on it. And it does take time. You can't just know what happened. There's investigations going on. They have to relay that information. And so really, when you see that first story, don't take it just on face value, but go back and do your homework a little bit and, and make sure that you're thinking about what it is that you're reading. I know the middle panelists also talked about the mental health piece. How can journalists push that forward? Or can we with privacy? and HIPAA laws preventing us from some we sort can. of access. I think that, you know, one of the, the reasons that I love being a journalist is because it is the opportunity to shine light on and to, to destigmatize certain things that I think would otherwise carry a stigma. And the fact that you can humanize the idea of mental health, the fact that we're talking about it so much more um, is really important. I, it's using our platform for good. The panelists indicate that at least in the shooting at Parkland and possibly also Virginia Tech, had there been that connection there may not have been a shooting, that these shooters had obvious Right, but at the same time, issues. we don't want to jump to the conclusion that everyone who's, who's suffering from mental illness will automatically become a school shooter because that's obviously a huge leap as well. But I think it's, it's the idea of um, how something you know, negative in somebody's life, how it can lead to something else happening and how a lot of things are really interconnected in our world. Yeah, and I think... Um one of the main messages, and actually out of the middle panel, it, it's interesting that mental health came out of both the student panel and the middle panel, but also as I've been talking to experts, as we've talked about what schools on Long Island are doing in reaction to this, it's a multi-pronged approach. There's really no answer to just stopping school shootings. Otherwise, I think we would have done it already. Um, I think it's the mental health aspect, the infrastructure and making sure that your school is secure and maybe has a single point of entry or at least some sort of a check-in. Um, I think the communities differ on what they do and don't want. The, the balance of having your school look like a fortress as opposed to you know, having it look like a learning environment where students can be productive. Um, but then also, so I think that mental mental health piece, and I don't think, I think because the guns are so controversial, it has taken away a little bit from the mental health piece. And how do you do, how do you make legislation? How do you make change? And the students really, I thought with their videos uh, that they showed, spoke to that with just reaching out and not, not being a bully or helping someone who's being bullied. I think there's more of a conversation now with that. So you observed both of the previous panels. What was your best takeaway from the one that featured law enforcement? Um, I think just, I, I thought that it was really interesting, their discussion with uh, wanting to have those relationships beforehand. And it's almost the similar with the media and having, uh, having students feel comfortable, having maybe a community police officer or a school resource officer where the kids know they can go to be safe and know that they have someone trusted they can talk to before something happens. 
And for me, I'm just always stunned by the kids' resilience. I mean, I had the opportunity to speak one-on-one -on -one with one of the, Do the Douglas students before sitting on this panel. And just, you know, I said, how school do you still? Are you afraid to go back? And he said, no, oh no, you know, I, I still go to school. And he just, these kids, kids are just so resilient. And it's, it's terrible that they're having to face these things that beyond test their resiliency at such a young age. But I do think that it is heartwarming that uh, that these kids, you know, that they're talking about mental health, they're talking about supporting each other, and I, I, it, it gives me hope for how this will be fixed in the future. And I do believe hope was the overriding theme of today's event, that if we didn't believe there was a better way and a better space for our children, that we can make these schools safer, none of us would have said yes. I mean, that's essentially why we all showed up and uh, took notes during the previous panels. I know it has been a full day, but I don't want to leave anything off the table. I know people outside this gathering may have some thoughts on the subject. So what would you like them to take away from what you've heard and what you've shared today? If you had to distill it to its essence. I think the idea that they shouldn't be afraid of the media and that we can be good partners when it comes to working together to end school violence, whether we're we're parachuting in or coming in to a community to cover, but then also to find ways to prevent it from even happening, to be able to use our platforms um, as media outlets for good. And just really communication. I mean, being able, whether it's the students, the law enforcement, the media experts, just to have that discussion and not being afraid to talk about all these different topics, even though they may be difficult. I mean, some of the students when they were talking about their experience, I was a little nervous for them to, to even come out with their stories, but they did. And, and they clearly realized how important it is to have this discussion nationally and not just to let it go by the wayside because clearly it continues to happen. I realize there's a lot going on and you said you went to the march with the students from your region. I'd like to circle back and ask a bit more about what that was like. Were you on the buses with them? Did you fly in and meet them there? How did that work? Yeah, no, I, um, we got on the bus at midnight and uh, we went all the way through. They came with their pillows and, you know, all their, their games and <laughs> their music and they slept most of the way there. And then, uh, you know, as they were starting to get towards D.C., just getting really excited, they brought posters, they had T-shirts, they had stickers, and they, we, we stood there for hours. I mean, I've never stood in one place for so long in my life. Um, and they, but they loved it. They were like, every, anytime one of the speakers came on, oh, there's Emma, there's so-and-so, you know, they knew these students and they were wanting to take it back. And a lot of them actually did and, and organized um, walkouts and marches and different uh, voting events and, and saying, okay, I'm not 18 yet, but I plan on voting and this is why, and this is sort of where I'm going to take this. And I thought it was really empowering um, to watch them and also inspiring to see, I mean, I don't remember being that active as a high school student. And so seeing them have this worldview and be so connected to something, uh, no matter what their political stance was, was really powerful. And you're an education reporter by nature? Is that how you started? Well, in so industry? I started doing a number of things. So I mostly cover like life and culture and the way we live today and more specifically parenting. And so I've covered a lot of the second day in the feature stories, how to talk to your children about school shootings, what are different acts of violence. I mean, I think a lot of times we think of violence in the schools and it's just shooting, but there's so many uh, other things that are happen that are terrible, whether it's bullying or different instances or acts of bombs or violence or ho however. Um, and so I tend to oversee a lot of the second day stories, as you mentioned. Okay, so going forward, what would your second day story be after an event like this? What would you take away to your readers if you had to report on the Safe Schools Digital Summit? I think that the hope of the students and their ability to be so open, so honest, so resilient, and so strong after what happened is really inspiring. And I think that is what, what we need to see. And we need uh, students to be able to be open and to talk about what happened to them. Um, because as we've seen, the idea of, of gun regulations is incredibly politicized. Uh, governmental regulations on school shooting also incredibly politicized. It seems like our country really breaks down when it comes to talking about it from that point of view. But no matter if you're red or blue, whoever you voted for, I think we can all agree that we don't want our children to be unsafe in schools. And humanizing it and putting a face on it really takes the politics out of it.
And if you were reporting on exactly the same, what would your story be? I think that it's interesting how many, we, we, we had a discussion before this panel about how many people were viewing and there are thousands of people from across the nation viewing these panels. So clearly there, there's a need for this and there's a desire to kind of hear what the resolutions are and also the push for mental health. I mean, that came out on all of the panels was maybe we're, we're so split on gun issues and we can't get as much movement one way or the other, wherever you want. But the mental health piece, everyone can agree that supports for mental health are important. And so how do we go about strengthening those? Without stigmatizing mm -hmm. and using the broad brush would be patently unfair. But it sounds like in certain cases, an intervention may have prevented these awful situations that we're here to discuss. Mental health is a tricky story to tell in any context because you do have to get past, you know, apprehension about admitting that you may be in need of counseling. But I thought it was very open and encouraging to hear the young people discuss that right out of the gate in the first session today. I hope you took away from that exactly what I did, that indeed hope is the uh, baseline of this whole event. And I wanna make sure I don't leave anything else out because when you talked about going to the march, your face lit up. Mm -hmm. You came away with something positive from that as well. And that reflected in your stories? I, I think so. I mean, as you're covering events like this as a reporter, you're trying to be as unbiased as possible, but I think that we can all get behind students standing up for something they believe in, no matter what that is. And to me, I mean, I, I feel like I cried through, through the whole event because it was just so powerful to hear so many people, to see so many people there for one thing or, or for many, many dis different aspects of life. I mean, we had students of color, we had white students, you know, talking about the differences in their lives and who's getting coverage, who's not. And I thought that was really um, a powerful event. It's definitely one of the things, as a reporter, there are a few things in your career that you look back on as really milestones. And I think that for me was um, being able to cover that and, and get the feelings of the students right from the ground was really important. And it really fed into the story because the readers on Long Island who didn't go could tell why the students were there. And they felt a connection with Parkland, which really was the genesis of that gathering. Mm -hmm. Why Parkland as the spark and not a Columbine? Is social media social the variable? Media. We're a very different time, even though it's only you know, 20, 25 years separate between them. The fact that the students are able to have such a voice now is really opening up the discussion. And again, I think it's really humanizing to see the video from inside the classroom. I mean, a lot of us couldn't imagine what it's like to be a, a young a young adult cowering in a classroom with gunshots and to actually hear it. Hear it. Mm -hmm. It took you there. Oh, right. Devastatingly so. I think it grabbed everybody by the heartstrings. But you mentioned race at the March on Washington gathering, and that begs the question why haven't we given schools of color in uh, underprivileged communities the same level of attention that now is being poured into places like Parkland? What's the linchpin there? I mean, from the media's perspective, yes. I couldn't tell you. From a newsroom, I've never been told, like, we're covering this because these are white students or we're not covering this. Um, but I think there's just less, I don't know if it's less of a desire for it or maybe there's more... For example, one of the students at March for Our Lives was talking about how in her community there's gun, sh gun violence daily, and so you almost get desensitized to it. And so, you know, why cover one shooting when... in, in news-wise, you have this other shooting with a lot of people and in a community where you wouldn't expect it. So it's a little bit of a difference for coverage there. And I don't think that's necessarily making this more important than that. And I think it's something that we as the media need to look at. And I think newsrooms um, across the U.S. are looking at ways to have more diversity among reporters. Um, and that changes your perspective and then what you're covering. I think you opened the door. That, I mean, that, the yeah. diversity thing is key. I mean, I've worked at a lot of newsrooms over my career, and I can say it's a problem. It is a major problem that we, as journalists, a lot of times, you know, people of color do not get the same coverage as the the affluent, white, whatever. You know, it, it, and it's an issue. And I think once you have more people of color in positions, once you have more women in positions, uh, people from different backgrounds, um, you are going to bring a lot of different conversations. And you can say, you know, 
know, I've been in newsrooms where I've said, why aren't we covering this? We need to be giving more attention to that. And as I've worked my way up the chain and become, you know, more of an editor and more of the person overseeing the coverage, I've been able to bring different perspectives in. And I think we need more people talking about it. So I think that's a really important question you brought up. Amen and cosine, as the kids would say. I think the question comes from what I heard watching as a viewer and a journalist the March on Washington speeches, because I think one young lady in particular came from Chicago, where maybe there is a lot of gunplay, but it should never be expected or accepted that children right. have to go to sleep to the, that noise. So I think Parkland has helped push that conversation. Those young people have been more open and inviting mm -hmm. to children who don't look like them necessarily, who don't live like they do, because they realize now this can happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. I think Parkland really underscored that. The school violence doesn't discriminate. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why this conversation matters so much. And I'm so grateful that you all could be here to take part in it. Did I leave anything out? You're a journalist. Let me ask you. <laughs> what do you want to make sure the moderator doesn't leave on the table? You know, I think you've been asking us a lot of questions. I would like to hear how you feel covering this, especially because you have such a unique perspective working, you know, local. Um, and so having the opportunity to, ve to develop relationships. Well, the relationships are helpful because I've come to learn a lot of folks in law enforcement by name, and I was thrilled with the panel that preceded us because they're key to getting some of the truth before the panic has kicked in with the, the witnesses and the victims. They don't know what they saw, but sometimes law enforcement can drill down and tell you exactly what went down, you know, how many shots were fired, what weapons were used, what direction the person who made entry, how, how did they get into the school in the first place? What can be done to harden the target, perhaps? You can get that from the professionals, but the anecdotal stuff from the victims and the community connections are vital. It has um, informed my career, being able to stay in one place for a while and learn how people live and slide in and be recognized and that breaks down some of the barriers. Because unlike print, when we show up, we've got big cameras and microphones mm -hmm. and those you know, news trucks that can be very off-putting. Um, but we don't want people to meet us for the first time on their worst day. I can't stress that enough. So the local connection has mattered a lot when we pursue stories like the ones we're talking about, where it may just be one person shot, not 17, mm -hmm. because those still matter to the people who caught those bullets and whose loved ones are being treated and triaged. So we try to bring that extra level of connection, almost intimacy even, because we live in these communities too. So thank you for asking. Moderators aren't supposed to get this engaged, but it's just the three of us, so right. and whoever's out there watching. But thank you. Thank you. That means a lot because I agree we all have a role to play. And demystifying the role of the media is why I said yes to this panel today. Too many people don't know how we pull this all together. But it's a, it's a human effort, and we do make mistakes, but we try. Because well, we were children once, too. Right. Mm -hmm. And that we come into these things with the very best of intentions. I mean, I think the media um, is going through a, a really interesting phase right now. Um, and we are oftentimes criticized. And But at, at the just as we want to humanize any story we're telling, it's, I think it's important to show, right? We have the very best of intentions. We do make mistakes. We're honest with it. But we do the best we can to fix them as soon as possible. And it's really important to be able to give a platform to, to so many people. And sometimes the underrepresented voices in the communities where maybe gunplay is commonplace, but it's never, it should never be acceptable. And I think the children of Parkland have amplified that message in the best way. They survived it, and they know they're not alone. Mm -hmm. And the young man, Jake, earlier today, really grabbed me by the heartstrings. Mm -hmm. So Jake, if you're listening, it matters that you were here. We appreciate all of their involvement, and I appreciate you. But I know this is painful. When you roll up to a scene like this, your first sentiment is, I almost wish I didn't have to be here, that these things were not happening, but they are. Maybe not one a day, as you know, that became a myth after Parkland. I don't believe that was ever really validated, that there's been a one a day school shooting in this country since that distinguished uh, Valentine's Day will no longer be the same for the community around Marjorie Stoneman Douglas School. It, it just is. But for the rest of us who have to move on and tell these stories, once you get past the pain and the angst and the, uh, the uncomfortable nature of that assignment, do you talk to your people when they return? I mean, you wrap your arms around them. What's next when they return from a, a miserable assignment like this? 
I think it's important to talk. Um, and from those conversations, we come up with a lot of inspiring ideas of how we can cover the, a story or two give, you know, we kind of will say, oh, well, looks like mental health was a major contributor. So how can we cover mental health in a way that relates to more people? Or it looks like school funding was a contributor. So how can we cover a story that can shine a spotlight on that? So we find different ways to cover all of the different aspects of the story. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the same thing, looking at, at different ways that we can cover um, just similar topics and, and looking at parent perspectives and what can we give the community that, like I said, that second day story, not just, but the third and the fourth day. So not just what happened and how did it happen and okay, so maybe we should get metal detectors, but how can we be having these conversations with our kids? How can we be having these conversations with our administrators? That balance, I, this was really interesting. We had covered, um, we were trying to find out what schools had done with their recent state budgets. Uh, to harden, you know, harden the infrastructure of the schools and security, adding cameras, adding, um, some of them added these apps where if there's an emergency, they push it and it contacts uh, law enforcement. And um, the parents were getting kind of a story, but not quite everything because the school officials were hesitant to give all the secrets out. I mean, if we tell you this certain software that we're using, then maybe someone can hack it. And so that there's really a balance. And I think that the more that the parents heard, oh, you're not just ignoring us. There's a reason behind that. But we need to know something. So you need to be communicating with us. And all these forums sprung up. And, and maybe that's sort of something that we can do as we're having these conversations is, is kind of help foster the, uh, the local connections and foster this among parents and students and, and law enforcement and bring them together. Hacking the apps. I hadn't thought about that. That's a story I think we can all look into. Right. <laughs> I know one thing that has helped us going into any shooting where there's victims who may or may not have perished is GoFundMe. It seems families want to open up and talk about their loss, their loved one, their expenses going forward if you can amplify their GoFundMe. Is that happening in your community too? Yes. Uh, we talk a lot about GoFundMe, and in fact, I, as a journalist, have even worked with GoFundMe where they'll flag us to some of the most interesting stories on there, and that becomes the, you know, the kickoff for a story. Um, I think you know, it's unfortunate that people have to use something like GoFundMe to fund their medical care or mental health care after, but at the same time, it really does uh, bring the community together to be able to help these families. And as you've said, it, it, you know, it, it opens it up. People are very honest, and it shows photos of their families and of what happened and so I think it's an interesting uh, it adds just yet another side of the story it's a far cry from car washes mm -hmm. it wasn't that long ago the that car right. washes and bake sales were how people were paying for funerals when children died too soon right well and I do think that the, the worst thing I know you, you've said it doesn't feel like there's a school shooting happening every day sometimes it feels like they're just happening all the time and I would think like the greatest tragedy would be for people to become numb to it and unfortunately I think that is something that's happening not just journalists but to to people who are just consumers of news and information and I think it's really important that we cover not just the second day story but the anniversary and stories that connect and to keep it going I mean at Yahoo Parent uh, when I ran that, I was really proud that we had done a lot with Sandy Hook, even though it's been some time um, since that happened. But these are parents that are still fighting for gun regulations, trying to keep their children's memory alive. And I, I think it's important to, that we continue to amplify and humanize these voices. Mm -hmm. And I think the humanizing is really important. I covered crime for a while for the Albany Times Union. And like you said, you walk up to the doors of these families and you get a pit in your stomach like, oh, I don't want to knock on this door, but I have to and it's important. And one of the things that I always stress when I'm covering something like that is it's absolutely terrible that this happened to your loved one. But we want to tell their stories so that they're remembered for who they were and not just what happened to them. So they weren't just the person who was involved in this terrible crash or was involved in the school shooting, but they were Keisha Kluke, a daughter. Uh, you know, you want to remember them and, and having their memory helps people connect to it so that maybe they do take action. So they do start the GoFundMes and then the other stories of that kind of add to that and keep the story alive without feeling like you're having the same conversation. Okay. Wow, GoFundMe, or Kickstarter, mm -hmm. seems to have uh, changed our barriers to entry. 
some of them right. are, are falling away because people desperately need that exposure. Well, and people go viral with certain things. I mean, I feel like the, the way that the digital platforms have impacted how we as journalists cover stories, is, it's, you know, it's been a great help to be able to have so many people involved in the story and so many voices. Um, but then again, you know, also GoFundMes have been exposed as being fake. And I hate to be cynical and say, well, you have to look at it. But I do think we always have to look at something with a critical eye, whether it's on Twitter, on GoFundMe, or in a newspaper. Did that person really have cancer or not? Oh, you know, we've, terrible. We've, some have been burned. We cringe when we think about it, that there before the grace, any of our newsrooms could have been sucked into the vortex of a scam. Of course. Disguised as a good cause. Well, it's human nature that we want to help people. And I think that's a good thing. But at the same time, I, I just think like just any media we read now really needs to be with a, a critical eye. Mm -hmm. And also the same with, uh, you had just reminded me of social media and the quickness of spreading information right now. Um, it's so fast and we will get a tip, hey, we heard there's, I, this happened a few weeks ago, hey, we heard there's a shooting at this school. And you know, of course we're all on red alert, oh no, what's gonna happen, thinking of the worst. And then you contact the school and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. No, there's nothing going on. And the law enforcement are saying, we never even got a call about it. So being able to, to shut that down right away and not follow through with rumors is really important. And I think that's also important for, we were talking about the public relations professionals, knowing that squashing the story quickly is just as important because you don't want to have that, that frenzy. And having people be afraid, especially in such a personal situation of a shooting, I mean, that's every parent's worst nightmare. I think that cliche is actually appropriate today because we brought up the conversation about safe schools and shootings are the centerpiece of this discussion. We're winding down now. I know we really are about to run out of time, but I don't want to leave your closing thoughts um, abbreviated. So please, whenever you're ready, Lindsay, Keisha, let me know what's on your heart before we call it a day. Yeah. I, I think, you know, as we said earlier, I think hope is a really important and powerful emotion. And I hope that people take these panels and they feel empowered to do what gives them uh, hope and to, to make real changes, whether that's calling their congressperson, you know, talking to their children about how to keep safe or, you know, all of the above. I, I really think that there's a lot of smart people that are here today on this campus that are the thousands of people who are listening in and together we can make a change. And I think just the importance of c continuing the conversation outside of this with anyone, even if it's just a neighbor bringing it up, but realizing that there's no one solution. And so clearly a lot of different avenues need to be explored. So care, caution, compassion, accuracy. I mean, we're here for the journalism piece, so we have to stress the accuracy because mm -hmm. that's where people look to us for the truth in times of crisis. So... Um, You've shared with us 15 years in the industry, mm -hmm. and how long for you? About nine. Okay, well, uh, continued success. Thank you for contributing. I know in closing thoughts, I'm just honored to be with you to learn from the digital space, because I mean, Yahoo is everywhere, it seems, and Newsday, and the things that you bring to the table uh, inform what we do on the broadcast side. I mean, we're all, we do get along. We do share resources. We do read and watch each other. I just am concerned for the folks out there who don't rely on mainstream or legacy media for their information and only go to social. Social is useful, but it isn't the end-all be-all. And I think it has helped us in our storytelling with these school shootings and other spaces. But it's got to be a mix. It can't be one, one silo. In other words, we have to branch out if we're going to get it right and keep our kids safe. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you for tuning thank in. Thank you. Yeah. It's been um, a refreshing, informative, kind of heavy day when you think about it, that we even have to have a gathering like this. But I'm glad to have been a part of the conversation. Lindsay, Keisha, thank you so much. And thank, thank you. you. My name is Errol Southers, and I want to thank you again for joining us for the inaugural National Summit on School Violence Prevention. We had three incredible panels today covering our students' concerns, security and what it really means and that there's no profile, and most importantly, how our journalists address school shootings. I'm going to leave you with a few action items, but before I do, I want to thank the University of Southern California and especially our sponsors and our donors who made this possible today, a number of organizations that deserve mention, Amwins Group, 
Alliant, Markle, Chubb, Harry Zimmerman, Allegiant, BPEM, and Great American Insurance. Thank you for your support. I want to thank our students who volunteered their time over the last several weeks to make this possible, the incredible crew that we've had today. And let me just say this. I'm going to leave you with a couple of action items for things that we really should be talking about doing here. First of all, as I mentioned previously, we are into some cutting edge research and work that's being done here at the university. Our new National Science Foundation study, the impact of building design attributes on occupant behavior in response to active shooter incidents in offices and schools is something that's never been done before. So for those of you who would like to participate in, fo in fo focus groups on that study, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Go to our site at sci.usc.edu for more information. With those experts, especially in those domains, we'd love to have you. Second, I'd like to say we want to facilitate a network of excellence here. So for those persons who want to contribute to school safety, and that's everybody because we don't have a safe school, if we don't have a safe community, please get in touch with us. But last but not least, thank you for your time. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you for caring about our country as we engage today, moving toward a new understanding of school safety. Thank you.